sessions today. My name is my name is Dr. Amanda Loheiser, and I will be moderating this session. And before I introduce your presenter today, there's a couple of housekeeping details that I want to take care of. The first is to prevent audio feedback. If you could please keep your microphone silenced during the presentation, unless, of course, Joe asks you to turn it on. And the session will be recorded. So if you don't wish for your lovely faces to be on the recording, kindly turn your cameras off. If you don't mind your lovely face being recorded, then go ahead and keep your camera on. So the session is scheduled to run until 2 p.m., which is to say 45 minutes, and I will leave it to the presenter to take questions at the end if she wishes. There's also an after hours session to update you on what's going on at the Center for Applied Imagination. Uh, you can find that link in the schedule document and that will take place right after today's session. And now let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Joe Udis to you today. For those of you who do not know Joe, Joe is an adjunct assistant professor in the Master of Science Program Distance Coordinator at the Center for Applied Imagination at SUNY Buffalo State University. She's the owner and president of United Innovations, an organization development consulting firm training people in organization development, creative problem solving, and facilitation skills in the United States and Brazil. She received the Chancellor's Medal for Excellence in Adjunct Teaching in 2017 and received five faculty appreciation awards, six outstanding service learning class awards from civic and community engagement, and the 2019 Mid-Career Faculty Award for Community Engagement. Now, Joe is here today to share with you about inclusive leadership and creativity, improving our life puzzles. And I can't wait for her to get started. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Dr. Joe Udis. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, as I said, it was kind of a last minute ad, but it's my favorite subject. A number of years ago, we had a program here at Buffalo State called the National Coalition Building Institute, in which we uh, offered diversity sessions to various groups around the area, some in the college, some in some businesses and so on. And I got very involved in that and really was enjoying uh, having uh, learn about diversity and start to think of, think of it in a more positive way and a different way. Then in the last few years, I started seeing more material on inclusive leadership. And since I have a doctorate in leadership, it seemed to me that was a topic that I wanted to pursue. And I started in, I thought, ah, oh, this, is, this is a match. This is exactly what I wanted to know about. So I began to uh, work on it. Now, I take it you are seeing this. Not seeing your screen. You're not seeing it? No. Okay, let me try again. All right. Oh, it seems to be there. Okay. Um, so I called this inclusive leadership and creativity because one of the things I learned about inclusive leadership is I think we teach it here. So in my presentation, I'll be presenting the reasons why I think so and see what you think. Uh, the idea was to improve our personal pieces so that all the pieces fit our personal puzzles. If ever there was a time for leadership, this is it. Wouldn't you say? We have pandemics of all sorts. We have not just COVID, but we have violence, gun violence, uh, inflation, uh, problems around the world, uh, weather, climate changes, all sorts of things that um, are needed uh, that are part of um, our leadership program we have to have. I'm getting distracted, Amanda, because you need to be admitting people. As they, yes, as, as they pop up, I'm admitting them. Oh, okay, because I kept seeing them. They're coming up on my screen too. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, they, they keep popping in. So I think le leadership is really critical and inclusive leadership to me is even more critical. 
early definitions of inclusive leadership uh, came from uh, Nemhard and Edmondson. And these are the people, this article particularly, uh, Nemhard and Edmondson is um, uh, the one of considered one of the seminal articles in inclusive leadership. This is kind of where they started to talk about it and get it get it rolling. Uh, basically, they suggested that words and deeds by leaders invite and appreciate others' contributions. They can take nature off its course, help to overcome status inhibiting effects on psychological safety. Psychological safety goes back to those emotions this morning, how people feel in an organization. Are they possibly able to participate? Later definitions, and I love the first one because our uh, keynote speaker tomorrow is Ronnie Ryder Paulman, who's one of the authors of this first one. And it is inclusive leadership refers to leaders who exhibit openness, accessibility, and availability in their interna interaction with followers. And then Shore Randell, Chung, Dean, Erhart, and Singh, boy, some of them, they line up so many people in their articles, it's hard to get it all in. But uh, Randell is another very uh, prominent author in the inclusive leadership field. They said inclusion is the degree to which an employee perceives that he or she is an esteemed member of the work group through experiencing treatment that satisfies his or her, ne her needs or belongingness and uniqueness. Those two words, belongingness and uniqueness are key throughout the material that I have been reading over the last several years. This is how it looks. Inclusion is the structure, culture, and mindset for all individuals, including the leader, to feel, I belong here. I feel valued. I can be my true self. I don't have to hide parts of my character. I can contribute. Now, if you think about each of these statements, you can think of people who might be feeling those things. For example, uh, I do not have to hide parts of my character. How many years did we have, don't ask, don't tell, hiding parts of people's character? Uh, these, are, these are strong features and that's the easy way of saying it, but if you look at the other connections, the uh, concepts behind it, belongingness, uniqueness, voice, opportunities, resources, all the things that people need to feel part of an organization are in that. And you can put the um, identities document up, uh, Amanda. So le inclusive leadership is a really huge topic. This is a great graphic from uh, a summit that appeared in the spring of 2018. And it's got so many pieces. So as people, how do we, what do we do with it? How do we start? What do we do first? And the truth is, first is self-leadership. In order to be an effective, inclusive leader, we first have to look at ourselves. How do we lead ourselves? How do we think? How do we make decisions? What are we doing internally? Are we uh, being an inclusive leader? And if we're not, why are, where is the whole? Well, what is it we're not doing? We have to kind of start to examine things. And what, I think something went wrong, but I will find out. Yep, all right. First, I would like you to take uh, the document that Amanda has put into the chat. It's called Some Social Identities. And I would like you to open it and on the left, check the social identities that seem to have some meaning for you. Whatever meaning that might be, just check it, just so you have a, a reference point. And there are three reasons for this. The first one is that uh, when, you, when you look at this identity, is it something that has affected you? Some 
way in which you've been uh, either discriminated against or teased for or uh, has been something that affected your uh, feeling of accomplishment, feeling of belonging, feeling of inclusiveness in an organization. That's the first part. Second part is which ones show you some of the things that other people are discriminated against for. And the interesting thing is these are social identities. These are things over which you have no control. This is, got this, it's, it's there. To give you a third example is that this also can affect your leadership. It may affect your leadership positively or negatively or both. And I'll give you an example. I use birth order. I was first born. My brother was born five years later. I was definitely the boss. I knew what to do. I knew how to make things work. And I, he had to listen to me because I was bigger than him. And so I knew how to boss. I knew how to lead. But what happened was later on, I discovered that because I was so used to bossing and being in charge, I didn't let other people lead. I didn't empower anyone else to have those kind of skills or to develop those skills. So it helped my leadership, but it also limited or challenged my leadership. And that's what I'd like you to do, just take a couple of minutes to do that uh, for some of those identities yourself. And as you do, I'm gonna to continue to chat about it. Uh, if you think about some of the things don't seem like they would be all that important. Hair, hair color. How many redheaded people do you know? And why do we call them redheaded instead of people with red hair? And have you ever heard that redheaded people have hot tempers? or other things that you might've heard. This is a little tiny one, but it's an example of how we kind of discriminate. And we tend to look at certain things, certain characteristics of people and make judgments about whether they're capable or not. We don't mean to, we don't, we don't do it deliberately. We don't think about, oh, how can I hurt that person? But we do these little things without even without even noticing. Um, skin color, what I have found fascinating when I uh, talk with um, my students who are, uh, for example, who are black or brown, uh, skin color is important in their families. And there's a discrimination on the level of skin color. And I see Megan shaking her head, yes, that that happens. It's a kind of discrimination that it's over nothing the person can control. It's, it's one of the social identities. And if we have these little biases, they creep up into our leadership and they pop into our work when we, we use it out in the field. We, we don't even know we're doing it because it's something that's been with us for a long time and we just kind of bump into it and we don't, we don't think about it. So any of the ones that you see on there, are there any questions about them or any way that you can't see how this one works? Please ask me. Doesn't imagination. Imagination? Ah, yeah. uh, well, imagination is not, welcome everywhere okay uh i got you you okay. got me yeah, uh, we'll i yeah mm -hmm. i worked in a lot of businesses i was a, i have my own consulting business and i could not go into an organization and teach creative problem solving for example because creativity is a fluffy word doesn't mean anything to that and problem was the one that surprised me they didn't want to admit they had problems, so we couldn't do problem solving. I could do uh, new solutions. I could do innovation. How you get innovation without creativity, I'm not sure. But I did the same program as I would do in creativity. I just didn't use the words. 
Isn't that interesting? The words had values. And imagination was one of them. I'd start, uh, sometimes we do um, uh, ideation sessions and being a person that has experienced that for over 40 years, I would try to get them started by saying some wacky thing to get them to say anything at all. They say, oh, that's stupid. We don't want to, we don't want to talk about stuff like that. That's imagination. They didn't like it. It didn't, they couldn't even see that it could possibly have a connection. So that was what I meant by that. So keep this paper and think about um, how any of those might have affected you in terms of how you treat any particular person. And if you treat any particular person that way, it may be that it creeps into your work as well and that you're, you're using it in terms of not being as inclusive a leader as you might be. So think about that. Hey, Joe. Yes. <clears throat> uh, this is Harry. Quick question. Um, I have found in certain situations that the voice, the loud voice or soft voice, uh, can be a, an element that affects leadership. Like um, we've done some exercises at SIPSI, as you know, <laughs> uh, forming a square with a rope, for instance, with uh, 25 people. And the person with the loudest voice tends to tell everybody, starts telling everybody what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, because I didn't see it in the list that you had there. No, there's this, if you notice the level, the label of it is some social identities. Oh, okay. okay. I was trying to fit everything on a page and I even doubled yeah. up on some because I, I wanted them in, but I couldn't fit everything. Uh, there are some that, there are so many that we can't <clears throat> okay. get to, but I agree with you. Uh, and I've been, uh, I have students who are extremely intelligent, extremely smart, extremely good at everything they speak like this and you can hardly hear them yep. and they don't, don't they don't put themselves out they don't they don't um they don't show up because they are so quiet that people don't pay attention and i so that's right on your topic okay well the thing is we have to start somewhere so I found some material from Brady and Van Dam uh, that are levels to becoming an inclusive leader. Uh, the levels, if there's levels, let's take a look at levels and see how that works. The first level is becoming aware. Anyone who's unaware is just not an inclusive leader because they, they're not paying attention to anything. They're not aware of even the issues. But becoming aware means that you understand bias and increase, increase your awareness of conscious and unconscious biases. Uh, this is why the social identities piece. These are conscious and unconscious biases, things that we do that we don't even think about. Um, and value equity, recognizing historic systems of privilege and oppression and the benefits of dismantling them. Those are hard to see. Uh, if you've never read, if you're a white person or even a black person or anybody, any person, and you haven't read Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking the, not something like Unpacking the Backpack, you'll get a list later, you can find it, um, about white privilege. She's a white woman who wrote, who suddenly realized all the ways that she had privilege that other people didn't have. So those kind of things, becoming aware of those. I see that I changed in my presentation and didn't, um, <laughs> forgot. Uh, diversity is not just about black and white. And that's, again, this whole uh, social identities. Diversity is a social identity. Uh, occupation, disability, life experiences, the political, oh, political drives me nuts. How do these senators ever get anything done when they have so much animosity across the aisle that they don't even want to talk to each other. That's definitely a, a problem, a diversity problem. And this is where I was originally going to put the uh, unconscious biases on the chat. Those biases have meanings. 
Uh, there's a lot of, we don't always examine our, our biases. And this is what, these are eight of the biases that, the ways that we use bias. Anchoring is the thing that we hear first. We hear it first, that's what we believe is true. Well, but I heard it this way. No, I heard it that way. Whatever you heard first is the one that you're more likely to believe. Availability bias is, oh, it's, um, I saw it on my desk. Okay, this is what's true because it's handy. It's right there. Bandwagon is groupthink. This is when we don't make individual decisions, but everybody else is doing it, so we do it too. Groupthink is a really dangerous form of bias because it does uh, happen. Unfortunately, you've seen it happen in some of the gang violence and so on. People just do it because everybody else is. Confirmation bias, well, it agrees with the way I think, so it must be right. You recognize that one? <laughs> yes. Fundamental attribution er error. Oh, I love this one. Those people would or wouldn't because of their character. My daughter and I were watching a murder mystery the other day. It was on a plane and somebody was uh, injected with poison on the plane. And we're pretty good usually at picking out the suspects. Who did what? Which ones are guilty? We missed totally because it never occurred to us that the air marshal would kill somebody on the plane. That person has, they're there to protect everybody. It just didn't even register with us that that person might be guilty, and he was. So that's a, a bias that we have. We forget to notice things. Horns and halo. People that we like or don't like, we like the people. The people we like, we think they tend. We tend to like the stuff they say. People we don't like, we don't like anything they say. And you can use that politically too. That works out in that sense. Stereotype is a generalized fixed belief. It is not. Um, Thinking through, it's based on old tapes, uh, on standards that maybe came from who knows where originally, but we have a generalized fixed belief about something and that's the bias that we hold. And the similarity bias, this is when, oh, those people, those people are teachers, so they probably think like me. No, not necessarily. If you really listen and pay attention, they don't necessarily think like you. So this is a way to analyze our cognitive biases. In order to figure out inclusivity, we have to look at what causes exclusivity. How do people get to be feeling uh, shut out? And there are four eyes of oppression. I think this will oppression. play well. It's a word that's often used as a blanket term, but there's actually a whole lot more to it. There are four interlocking aspects of oppression, I ideological, my, institutional, interpersonal, showing. and internalized. And it might seem like a small difference, but it's very important to be able to distinguish between each kind because understanding oppression is the first step to fighting it. Let's start with the core at the heart of every form of oppression, ideology. Every system of oppression comes from the idea that one group is somehow better than another. Ideological oppression starts when the dominant group associates positive qualities with itself and negative qualities with the marginalized or othered group. Ideological oppression describes the deeply ingrained social root of inequality. It's the larger overarching idea that leads to the isms. For example, the idea that black people are dangerous is ideological racism. The idea that poor people are lazy is ideological classism. Ideological oppression leads to institutional oppression. Institutional oppression is the way that systems and institutions manifest the dominant ideology. Institutions control access, who is able to get to what and how. This includes legal rights, police practice, access to medical care and education, public policy, political power, and media representation. For example, when women make two thirds of what men make, that's institutional sexism. When a building is constructed without wheelchair ramps, that's institutional ableism. 
all of this leads to interpersonal oppression. Interpersonal oppression is probably the easiest to recognize because it happens all around us. Interpersonal oppression is the way that people play out discrimination and violence on each other. It can take the form of microaggressions, jokes, stereotypes, and harassment. For example, when a student is bullied for being gay, it's interpersonal homophobia. When a Muslim person is told that they're a terrorist, it's interpersonal Islamophobia. And all those forces, ideological, institutional, and interpersonal, lead to internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is the way that people with marginalized identities internalize narratives of their own inferiority. It's what leads people to feel less than. This is the end goal of oppression. The oppressive party doesn't need to exert force any longer because the marginalized group is enacting oppression on itself to maintain the status quo. It's important to remember that it's never a marginalized person's fault that they feel internalized oppression. It's simply what happens when someone faces negative stereotypes, low expectations, and ongoing discrimination. So, for example, an immigrant feeling embarrassed about having an accent is internalized xenophobia. When a trans woman feels that they can never be a real woman, that's internalized transphobia. So, to review, the four eyes of oppression are ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Each of these types are interconnected and completely supported by the others. They can never exist on their own and can even be seen as a cycle. Now that you understand the different kinds of oppression, you're even more equipped to fight it. Don't forget that any effort to dismantle oppression should aim to address it at all four of these levels. Thanks for watching. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So level two in becoming an inclusive leader is becoming an ally and an upstander. An ally partners for success, actively supports and advocates for women and other underrepresented groups. Advocating for belonging, create an environment where everyone feels uniquely seen, heard, and valued. These are the keys at this level. So this is the kind of behavior that gets us in this level. Acknowledging, connecting, and engaging. I'm not gonna read them all to you. Uh, you can read down through them and just touch on a few. Uh, this engages a broad range of, of perspectives. It's, for me, in creativity, we always look at various possibilities. Broad range of perspectives is what we do when we diverge. Uh, leaning into discomfort. It's hard for people to step in and talk when there's controversy, when there's tension, when there's problems. But opening up and talking about it and being vulnerable to talk about it are very important. Um, students, I've found um, if I acknowledge what I don't know, are very willing to talk to me about the things that uh, I don't know about them, uh, their religion, their background, anything that they're willing to share, I'm open. And um, if I've made a mistake, I apologize and, and listen to what they have to say. Very important, listening deeply and carefully. So be willing to learn and be influenced by others. Uh, the others are pretty much standard fostering independence and teamwork. Teamwork, I think, is critical. I, I think it's critical in my teaching undergrads because while they don't like to do teamwork because somehow <laughs> if I ask a uh, uh, class of students, how many ate teamwork, 90% uh, will raise their hands. And then I say, well, how many of you, when you've been in teamwork, you did all the work? And they all raise their hands. So they, if you all did the work in the team, <laughs> who was it didn't work? I don't know how this, how this happens. So it's something to, that is important for them to learn to do. And environment. Well, gee, we use Ekvall in creative studies. Uh, Goran Ekvall, a Swedish uh, researcher who in, uh, studied companies and which companies were more creative than other companies. And these were the 10 items that he uh, developed from that work. Uh, challenge doesn't mean we challenge each other to a duel or something. It means, is the work exciting? Is it interesting to do? Is it fun? 
Uh, is there freedom to choose how you do the work? Are, is the place energetic and lively? Are people happy to be there? Is there some playfulness? Is it okay to laugh? Students often report to me that they, they're in workplaces where if they laugh, they get punished because laughing means you're not working. Uh, trust that we believe in people, that there's time for ideas and support for ideas. Conflict is the only one that I've all found that was negatively related to creativity. Conflict is not a positive thing. Uh, low levels of conflict are more creative. Debate, on the other hand, high debate is good because conflict is about interpersonal things. Debate is about the issues, about things that are going on. And then is it okay to take a risk? Are you allowed? I had one company where the, they were trying to open up and they said, we want you to take risks. Just be very, very careful how you do it which really didn't encourage anybody very much. So it's something to think about, how you, how you build that into the environment. Then there's the leadership piece. There are inclusive behaviors for leaders, holding yourself and others accountable for, incre for creating an inclusive culture. If you're not doing it and others aren't doing it, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna fix it? Uh, let people see how decisions are made. Don't do it behind closed doors and say, well, the decision's been made. We don't need to discuss it any further. Um, I used to have a boss that would, he was owner of the company or well, he had been at one time. And he said, there are several types of decision-making. One is where we all get together and decide. Another one is where um, I will ask you your opinions. I will listen to all of your opinions and take them into account. But this is a situation where I'm the one responsible and I will make the final decision. And there are others that I'm not allowed to share with you and I will make the decision and I will communicate with you as much as I can. At least he was open. He told us what kind of decisions and let us know which one he was working on. That's the kind of thing that leads to inclusion. Very important is understanding and talking about how inclusion connects to the mission and vision. This is something that um, I'm a big mission and vision kind of person. I used to go into companies and say, do you have a mission or vision statement? They go, yeah, it's over there on the wall. Well, what does it say? Well, it's a whole bunch of stuff. I, I don't remember it all. Well, can you tell me general? No, I, it's just really long. Well, do you have a mission statement? Yeah, basically it's on the other wall and it's also very long and I don't, I don't know how to say it all. So it seemed to me they had wall-to-wall -wall management and nobody knew where, where they were or where they were going. So vision and mission are very important and having them be um, stated clearly, I think is important. And I saw one that I liked. Uh, I think it will be here in a minute. Um, Level three is becoming a change agent. Uh, a change agent sponsors. In other words, they help somebody else succeed. They empower them, they introduce them to people, they show them off, put a spotlight on them, uh, help them advance and make change, initiate and champion systems and cultures that are inclusive and equitable. Standing up and making a stand for the organization. This is what we need to do. Well, this is kind of company level and companies often have a problem. But leaders lead themselves, they lead relationships and they lead cultures. All of these are important for an inclusive leader. They focus on results, they leverage the diversity and talent they have in the organization. And there are a lot of skills that go with that. Some of the skills include these. Uh, I like this, the six signature traits of an inclusive leader. Cognizance, curiosity, cultural intelligence, collaboration, commitment, and courage. These begin to sound kind of familiar to me. Hmm, where have I seen this kind of stuff before? So I did some more research and I connected them. We'll see in a moment. 
Inclusive leadership has competencies, collaboration, empowering, courageous accountability, and awareness and clarity of vision and mission. What is it we're going to do? These, there's an interpersonal and an interpersonal dimension to each. So organizations, what do organizations do? Well, first of all, organizations don't want to do anything unless they know why they're doing it, right? They've got to have a strategy. They've got to have a plan. There's got to be a reason why we do something. If we're just doing it for fun, that's, that's not business related. So these are the things that the contextual antecedents are the things that you put in to make an inclusive environment. The climate, the leadership, and the practices of the organization. If those are all included in an include or put into an inclusive environment, you get employee perceptions of work group inclusion. They begin to believe, oh, I'm part of this. I belong here. And what you get out of it is so much for the organization. High quality relationships between group members and supervisors, job satisfaction, intention to stay. In other words, people don't leave. Um, job performance, organizational citizenship and commitment, uh, the well-being, the stress relief. This is the, these are the kinds of things that we talked about this morning. Creativity abounds. Career opportunities. These are the outcomes. So these are the whys. These are why an organization would want to have inclusive leadership. Another set of reasons from Bork and Titus, teams with inclusive leaders are 17% more likely to report they are high performance, high performing teams. 20% more likely to say they make high quality decisions. 29% more likely to report behaving collaboratively. And 10% improvement in perceptions of inclusion increases work attendance by almost one day a year per employee. Huh, reducing the cost of absenteeism. Good outcomes, good results. So inclusive leadership is the bridge from good intentions to impact and innovation. It's a thing that we need to do as leaders and organizations need to do to improve their bottom line. These are some organizational policies and practices that can help. Creating an environment of respect, fairness, justice, and equity. Here at Buff State, it's often called JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And a lot of the students are calling themselves JEDI warriors, which I think is really cool because it also ties into their, you know, movie things, so it works really well. Creating a framework, framework for assessing and implementing policies and practices. Fostering transparency, promoting teamwork, having a diverse organization, fostering continual learning and growth. To me, a goal for any organization is lifelong learning. I think it is a critical piece. It is for me personally, obviously, since I'm pretty old right now and I'm still learning stuff. Uh, I believe in lifelong learning and I believe organizations should and I believe leaders should believe in lifelong learning. This is um, one of the things I mentioned it earlier. I thought it was earlier in the presentation, but this is a logo from Elder Source, and it's their diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, and it's a logo, and they put it everywhere. And I thought, that is really nice, committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. When you stick it out there and you say, this is who we are, this is what we do, you pretty much have to do it, because people are going to call you on it if you don't. Um, and having a statement in the mission and vision of an organization is pretty important. We don't always have that. We usually look at business purposes, business missions and visions, but we also need to have the interpersonal part. So what's the creativity piece? Well, you know, I got to connect it because I believe in connection. 
This is an inclusive environment at work. This is uh, this was put out as something that HR people could work on. Uh, and you see some of the same things, sense of belonging, access to opportunity, trust, common purpose, meaningful work, cultural competence. These are the kind of uh, attributes that you can, you can build into an organization. And of course, ECFAL has resources, personal motivation and exploration. These are the same 10 items that we talked about earlier, just put into a, to a coordinated uh, collection. And if we do that, and we look at those six signature traits of creative leaders, or in, sorry, inclusive leaders. I, I teach both inclusive leadership and creative leadership. So sometimes I say the other word, but to me, they mean the same thing. And this is why. This is where I got really connected. And I came up with this. Here are the six signature traits of inclusive leadership. Commitment, highly inclusive leaders are committed to diversity and inclusion because these objectives align with their personal values and because they believe in the business case. In creative studies, in our program, we have students develop their personal visions, missions, and values, as well as philosophies of creativity and how it affects their lives. Courage, highly inclusive leaders speak up and challenge the status quo when they're humble about their strengths and weaknesses. Here, students are encouraged to identify and explore questions they have about the effects of creativity in their lives, their strengths and weaknesses, and to invite feedback about their work, as well as giving feedback to other people. That takes courage. Cognizance of bias. This is very similar to what I had you do earlier with the social identity sheet, uh, looking at the types of bias that are possible and how it might uh, influence their leadership. Curiosity, highly inclusive leaders have an open mindset, a desire to understand how others view and experience the world and a tolerance for ambiguity. Boy, are we clicking with creativity. Students are taught the affective thinking skills of openness to novelty and tolerance for error and ambiguity for all steps of creative problem solving, as well as cognitive and affective thinking skills that are useful in each step. Culturally intelligent, highly inclusive leaders are confident and effective in cross-cultural interactions. Here, students from a variety of countries and time zones work in cross-cultural teams on class projects, sharing and evaluating work together. And collaborative, highly inclusive leaders empower individuals as well as create and leverage the thinking of diverse groups. Students here, develop skills to proactively facilitate groups in creative problem solving, deliberately engaging imagination for predicaments or opportunities which may be ill-defined, novel, and complex. Sound like a match? This is where I started to think, you know what? We're teaching inclusive leadership, kind of parallel and probably could be more connected if we decide to do that which probably I will because I'm teaching one of the courses. So your personal choice is how you put the pieces together. You've got the personal choices, the biases, the leadership piece, the organization piece. You can put everything together creatively. And we're gonna take a look at how that might look. Well, first of all, You've got inclusionary choices personally, right? You decide how you feel about things. You decide what your biases are and which ones you can improve on. You have a, a, a leadership style. And if you've gone through our program, we look to have you be creative leaders. And I think also inclusive leaders. So creative and, loose, and inclusive leadership style. You build a, an inclusionary environment. We use ECFAL. We use uh, a very open kind of program in creative studies. So here we have the person, if you remember, um, our four Ps, we have the creative person, the creative process, the creative press, 
And the creative product is your inclusive creative leader identity. This is what you can make. So I'd like you to write the first two or three steps you might take in order to become a more creative leader and then a more inclusive leader and share it with us in the chat or live if you want. And we are right at 2 p.m. right now. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to talk as fast as I can and I don't talk. I always get carried away. So please put anything in the chat. The next session starts at 2.30. Um, I can double check that. It's uh, 2.15. 2.15. That is the, uh, the State of the Center updates with okay. Dr. Okay, 2.15. And I can so, put that link in the chat if people wanted it too. All right, and I will uh, hang on here. I'll turn off my share. And then if you have questions and things, I will hang around and listen because Right after we have that start that session, I'm going into um, class. I have a three o'clock class in creative innovation. All right, I see there's some things. All right. So I put that link in there, and I know that uh, also, Joe, you would like me to share the other sources that you have. Yeah, the, if you're interested, I asked Amanda to put uh, a, a document in the chat, and it's the, re, the references for the material that I used today and some extra references that I found helpful. One of the interesting things was there are so many new books. I went out and started looking at books. I ended up buying four of them. All of the books were 20, 2020 to 2023, mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe it. And then I thought, well, it's been a while since I looked at online resources uh, for articles, peer-reviewed articles. So I went to Butler Library and asked for peer-reviewed articles between 2019 and 2023, only peer-reviewed articles on inclusive leadership, and came up with 38,000. Wow. So... That's says this is this topic is hot. Now Samantha had her hand up. Samantha, did you have a question? Uh, so I'm actually currently enrolled in the uh, the master's program um, uh, for creativity at Buffalo. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Dr. Yudis, uh, will we be? Uh, well, I should. I don't know where we are in the courses, but will your courses specifically on you know innovation leadership? Are those um, primary courses that we'll all take, or would I look to take that as a? Um, yeah, the course the course I teach in the master's program is the the second summer course, which is uh, creative leadership, and um, it includes inclusive leadership and includes um, creative and inclusive leadership, and um, it's it's the capstone course for the certificate in creativity and change leadership. Excellent. And someone asked me a question about uh, uh, dynamism. Dynamism is if you go into an organization and everybody's bustling around and, and happy and speaks to each other and, and looks like they're enjoying their work, that's dynamic. It feels good to go there because it's energetic. Um, if you go in and everybody's sitting at their desk with their heads down, it's, it's kind of deadly. <laughs> Norbert, you, you had your hand up. Yeah, and thanks. Um, uh, hi, Joe, this is Noor, a great presentation. Hi. Thank you for, thank you. Uh, for um, a wonderful presentation. Um, I just want to ask if uh, it seems like that inclusive leadership is kind of a cutting edge uh, style of leadership. Can it be integrated with other styles of leadership, like the transformational leadership uh, or the transactional leadership? And does experience matters? Uh, like some some leaders are more experienced than, than there are some young leaders. Uh, but uh, can we count uh, the experience uh, uh, as a social identity, um, which may count uh, here in inclusive leadership? Well, yeah, I think to me, uh, virtually all of the leadership styles are um, at use at one time or another. 
but your choices of how you act as a leader in whatever style you're using can be inclusive or exclusive. So you, you decide. This is where I think personal choice is really critical. And that's why I said you create your inclusive leader identity. And then you take that with you. It's, it's like part of your mantle. And if you are uh, using situational leadership, you can be inclusive, right? If you're using transactional leadership, that can be inclusive. Transformational leadership can be inclusive. If you're using great man, I'm sorry, you need to go home. <laughs> I don't believe in great man theory. <laughs> and uh, Caitlin had a question. How might this translate to a virtual environment? Uh, Caitlin, are you thinking the dyna dynamism or what? Which specific yeah, thing? Yeah, you can, expanding on, you know, dynamism, I think is pretty evident in, in person, but there's other traits I think are, are just now starting to be kind of discovered and talked about because so much of work and organizations are structured differently in, in hybrid environments and virtual environments. Um, we're really only now just starting to see how things are translating. What do you think about that? Well, I think it, the dynamism can be translated. We kind of hope that we're building that into our online classes. If you've taken some of our online classes or you've taken other people's online classes, you may see a difference. We want you to be interactive with us in these sessions. We don't want to have a session that is uh, cold and uh, lecture driven and uh, there's no reason for you to ever open your microphone or talk to anybody. We want energy and excitement and we want you helping create it. To me, that's dynamism. Excuse me. Sure. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Kyle. Kyle had a question. Yeah, Kyle. I do. I do have a question. Joe, you said if you subscribe to the great man theory, get out. Right? <laughs> I'm joking. It's just, it's the one that kind of bugs me. Uh, so it drives, that's my least favorite thing in the entire world. Yeah. Like great man, I hate it. But I'm really bad at vocalize, like getting those thoughts out of my mouth in a coherent way to make people understand. Do you have like a one or two sentence? Like this is why the great man theory is ridiculous. Well, the great man theory subscribed to uh, that you had to be born into leadership. You had to be born into a prominent family with money and position and that that would make you a great man. And only great men were good leaders because they had the background and experience. And personally, uh, if we look at some of our great leaders, Lincoln, for example, didn't have that. Uh, and um, it's also that it was specifically meant to be men. And I certainly don't fit that category, so I don't like that part. Uh, same thing with trait theory. Only thing with trait theory is some of the traits that they felt were important are also developed, you can be developed. If you go with traits, if you think that traits are only inborn and you can only have them, you automatically have them or you don't have them. And a lot of people think that about creativity, you either have it or you don't. And if you feel that about trait theory, then that doesn't work for me either because I think traits can be developed. You can learn to be more of what you wanna be. You can right. learn to do some of the things that people who were born into it can do. And sometimes better because you know where you came from, you know what it's like to develop it. You know how it works. Right, thank you, that was a great mm -hmm. answer. It sounds like a great man theory is kind of connected to privilege. Like it's it's very much great, great people of a particular this and a particular that, and you know social standing and and everything yeah. else. Rockefellers, they were all yeah, and because they were born into money and and Kyle, that looks delicious. Whatever that is. <laughs> so uh, a couple of people had asked for that link to the YouTube video that you showed, Joe. So I found out. Uh, it it's in the, it's in the, the, the it's, yeah, it's, I, just, um, I don't know. I, I, I embedded it so the, I can probably back up and find it. I was just going to say, um, I had pasted it in the chat and is it, oh, in good. The, uh, this, if, is it in the, uh, let me see here. 
Okay, so the source document has got a ton of things on it too. I was just looking at that and thinking I'm totally gonna yeah. steal some of these sources. Yeah, um, I liked that, I liked that video very much. Yeah, here is the link to that YouTube video. Good. Once again, thank you. Did anybody else have any other questions, comments, queries, concerns? I love the alliteration, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I had a slide like that too. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> I had a lot of slides, but I got carried other, away, as always. It was great stuff, Joe. It was very interesting, very timely, and I think everybody, you know, takes takes things from that that they can apply. And the last screen, of course. Oh, and Kyle, you've got another question. I do. I have one more quick question. Joe, while you were looking for those papers, did you find any that talked about like inclusive leadership and the economic benefits of it? Uh, yeah, I found some and I didn't um, I didn't want to get too far into the economic benefits. I think they are in there. Uh, just the couple of slides that I mentioned, because I tried to keep it, I knew I was getting long, because that's, that's how I operate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been known to be short of words. I think it's anytime we're like deeply invested and interested in a topic too, you know, yeah. we just, we want to yeah. share so much about it. So we are coming up on 2.11 right now. I know that that uh, update on the center starts at 2.15. And um, uh, that link is uh, in the chat, but I will put it down here again. I'm not. I sure will. The entire link I'm going is. to share my screen one more time, just because if you want to get in touch with me, um, uh, it's got my um contact info. Yeah, my in awesome. There it is. Okay. Great. So you can. And get I am actually going to. We should stop the recording and stop. Oppression. It's a word that's off. And I put your email address into the chat as well. Thank you. That's very Absolutely. <sighs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This was really informative. This was a thank you. great topic. People have lots of questions and comments, which I think is always a sign of a, of a thought provoking topic. And I'm sure a lot of people, if you're anything like me, will think of more questions at like two o'clock in the morning or while you're washing the dinner dishes tonight. That's always when my ideas come to me. Oh, so well, that's Joe's why I wanted you to have the email address. Absolutely, I was just gonna say, so Joe put her email address in there and uh, you should totally reach out to her. So uh, I am going to, we've, we've stopped the recording here. Um, let me see here.